All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad everybody can join us tonight. Thank you for joining us at Bookshop for Spirited, an at-home cocktail event. Here with author and drinks expert, Adrian Stillman. And Hello. the author of Spirited, Cocktails from Around the World. <laughs> and Megan, uh, Megan Dorvin, a mixologist and NYC bar owner and director of Dear Irving and Rain's Law Room, which is a huge thrill to have Megan here as well. So uh, we know this week, especially as we record this, it's November 10th, uh, 2020 right now. It's a very strange, it's a very intense and important week right now across the country and the world. So we are very grateful to all of you for joining us. Thank you so much for taking the time and just be here, enjoy life and learn about mixing some delicious cocktails from our expert panelists here. So I'm Angela Januzzi. I work with marketing and special programs like this at Bookshop. I'm going to do a quick intro about Bookshop and our work supporting independent bookstores. And then I'm gonna hand it off to Adrian and to Megan who are gonna have a great conversation and teach you how to mix some wonderful drinks, variations on the whiskey sour. Again, uh, this is partially taken from Adrian's new book, a spirit egg cocktails from around the world, which is available in the link here in the chat. And again, if you are live, you'll get an email about it later too. So again, thank you so much to Adrian and Megan. I'm going to do a quick intro and then 30 minutes in, we're going to have our Q and A portion. If you could all just submit your questions using the Q and A icon at the bottom of your screen at that time. And again, feel free to chat uh, alongside in the corner here if you're live. Uh, so I'm going to go away for a little bit after I do the bookshop intro. Adrian and Megan are going to have uh, their great discussion, and then I'll come back to moderate your questions about 30 minutes into the event. Uh, and again, this is being recorded. It's going to be on YouTube, on Bookshop's YouTube channel. So please note that as well. And one last note, the questions that we're going to take uh, about 30 minutes in are going to be in real time and vetted in real time. So potentially you may not have your question answered if you submit it, but if you don't, we really appreciate your understanding for that too. So thank you to everyone in advance. So first a word about Bookshop and then we'll hand it over to Adrian and Megan. So Bookshop is an online bookstore retailer designed to help support independent bookstores. Every purchase you make on bookshop.org, currently in the US and now in the UK, directly supports independent and local bookstores. We do this because we believe that bookstores are essential to a healthy culture. They're where authors can connect with readers, where we discover new writers, where children get hooked on the thrill of reading that can last a lifetime. And of course, they're anchors for our downtowns and for our communities. So as more and more people buy their books online, even before quarantine, we wanted to create an easy and convenient way for you to get your books and support bookstores at the same time, especially from those stores whose e-commerce capacity and or inventory space we can help supplement. So as a standard, Bookshop always encourages customers to buy books directly from your local bookstore first. And if for some reason you cannot do so, you can come to bookshop.org, find your local stores on our map, on our website, and they'll receive the full profit off your order. Otherwise, if your order is not done that way, it'll still contribute to an earnings pool that will be evenly distributed among independent bookstores, even those that don't use Bookshop. So we also support anyone who advocates for books through our free affiliate program, which pays 10% commission on every sale and gives a matching 10% to that independent bookstore pool too. So if you're an author, a website, a magazine, a book club, anyone, you can sign up to be an affiliate for free. You can start your own shop and you can be rewarded to uh, have an advocacy for books. Bookshop wants to give back to everyone who promotes books, authors, and independent bookstores. So by design, we give away 75% of our profit margin or more to stores, the publications, the authors, everyone who makes up the thriving and inspirational culture around books. And again, if you're in the UK, Bookshop Now is launched there with your own site as well as separate site here in the United States. So we hope that Bookshop can help strengthen the fragile ecosystem and margins around book selling and keep local bookstores an integral part of our culture and our communities. Bookshop is a benefit corporation, a corporation dedicated to public good. And with that, we'll let Adrian Stillman, author of Spirited, and Megan Dorman take it away. And uh, I'll go away for a little bit, and I'll see you all at the Q&A portion about 30 minutes in. Have a awesome. good time. Thanks, Angela. And thanks, everyone, so much for being here. We're super thrilled to have you with us tonight and to mix up some cocktails. As Angela said, it's definitely been a a year and a, and a few couple of weeks that if, you know, if we ever needed a drink, it's probably right now. Uh, so as Angela said, I'm Adrian Stillman. I'm the author of Spirited. And I'm so pleased to be joined tonight by my friend and bartender, Megan. Um, 
And just on a personal note, I'm also really excited to be doing this event with Bookshop because I'm a, a big supporter of independent bookstores and anything that supports that ecosystem and those really important small businesses is something that's really important to me. So I think, you know, without further ado, we want to get you guys some, some drinks and some glasses. So Megan, will you take us away and, uh, and show us how to make a whiskey sour? Yes, thank you for having me. So quickly, I'm Megan Dorman. I run a couple of independent bars in New York City, Rain's Law Room and Dear Irving. So I'm excited to support independent bookstores and Adrian's new book, who I've seen out and about in New York City for many years. So let's start with a whiskey sour. If anyone's making it along with me, I hope you are. Uh, we can get started now. If you have a shaker like this, I always build in the small side. And what I like to do is build drinks in order of small affordable ingredients and work your way up to the spirit, which is usually the biggest part of the drink, but also the most expensive. So if we make a mistake, we can always find another lemon, but nobody wants to pour out rye whiskey right now, right? So I always use a jigger. You can always make do with tablespoons or just uh, squeezing right into the shaker, but at a cocktail bar, you know, we're open seven days a week. We're always going for consistency. So we're very careful about measuring. So for the whiskey sour, we're gonna use lemon juice, three quarters of an ounce, and the same amount of simple syrup, which is a pretty easy ratio, equal parts sweet and sour. And then you can always change that on your own at home for your personal taste, but it's a great way to start. And then two ounces of American whiskey, either rye or bourbon will always work in this drink. And we're gonna get a little advanced here right away and do a dry shake because I'm gonna make a traditional sour with egg white, um, which is optional and the drink is great either way, but this is a very classic way of making drinks, a very important American invention, cocktails. So I will make it along the lines of how they would have. And it just adds like a little silky texture, a little more volume, a little fluff on top, which is the technical term for that. <laughs> And what we do is shake it without ice first, just to like really emulsify the protein in the egg white, whip it up. Because when you're making a cocktail, you don't wanna taste everything just layered on top of each other. What we're trying to do is create a brand new flavor. So it takes a little elbow work, but it is worth it. So you can kind of just see here before I add ice that it's like nice and fluffy and it looks probably like a bigger drink than what you originally poured into it. You always wanna have your glass handy so there's no delay for your cocktail. I'm gonna do this on ice. Sours are served many different ways, but again, I'm just doing this a little more traditionally, which ice was very exciting when uh, it first came into cocktails in the 1800s. So now I'll add some ice. And again, the big thing about shaking is that you wanna hear the ice hitting both sides. Everybody has their own style. I definitely don't shake at my iPad, but that's my only real advice. <laughs> then my other professional tip is make sure nothing is stuck in the top because you don't want to cheat yourself at cocktail hour. You want every last drop. I use a little Hawthorne strainer just to keep the ice in, but let the drink come out. That's especially important if there was like fruit or anything in there. And you'll see that just that egg white just made like a nice kind of a fluffy top. It's hard in this light, but um, it's a little darker on the bottom and then it'll fluff up. And what bartenders like about this egg foam is that it holds things like uh, a little cinnamon or bitters or a lemon wheel. It's just kind of like an extra cushion there for anything you want to float on top. And when it comes to garnishes, I always say a little color contrast and a little aromatic is good because so much of what you taste is what you smell. So we always like to put a little Angostura or something on top and it'll kind of float in that foam. And you can just make a little swirl there. And that's the very classic 1862 and beyond whiskey sour. Well, cheers, Megan. 
And cheers to everyone else. I did not, I do not have egg white in my cocktail. So mine does not have that beautiful fluffy top. Mm. I'll just get the extra protein on this side. That's right. Thanks. Well, and for anyone who's feeling maybe a little squeamish about egg white, I, I really encourage you to try it. It is the, the texture for me, it's like a little kind of a little cloud. And I mm -hmm. think it's, it's delicious. Um, you can also use if you are, um, are vegan or just don't, don't really don't want to get into raw egg whites. You can also use, um, aquafaba, which is uh, chickpea water, which is, I have not experimented with personally, but Megan, have you? A little bit. Yeah. And it does work well. I think I hear a little bit more about a flavor than I do with egg white, like just mm -hmm. a touch of something else. Um, yeah. but it works quite well. And from what I've heard also really good for vegan, like baking and meringue kind of things. So pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. It's fun. You know, this kind of tees up what we wanted to talk about next, which is once you've mastered the classic, the classic recipe, which Megan just so expertly demoed for us, then kind of what's next? Like, how can you mix up the whiskey sour? What other things can you do that are, you know, that are sort of similar, whether that's seasonal or, um, or just according to your taste or, or your dietary preferences. Um, yeah. So yeah, Megan, tell us about some of your favorite ways to change up the, the classic. Yeah. So a big part of what we do as well, and I always hate to ruin the mystery of how many drinks I know, but actually a lot of times they're all kind of related. So sour is a big family. Mm -hmm. And if you just kind of zoom out and look at it as a bigger, bigger category, what you need is something sour, something sweet and a spirit. So whiskey sour is probably the best known, lemon, simple syrup, American whiskey, maybe an egg white, but that can really be anything. And we have so much more available to us than the earlier bartenders did that that's where we get to get playful. And we still very much use these formulas. The easiest thing I recommend is to play with the sweet element mm -hmm. because you can do so much with it, especially if you're near a cool farmer's market or you kind of go for a hike and you buy some cool maple syrup or some local honey, or yeah, in the summer you get some fresh fruit and either you wanna muddle it right in there or you wanna make a syrup. There's a lot of ways to just add either like a comforting touch or a more seasonal touch or even a spicy touch, which we'll talk about later, to a very classic formula. And once you get comfortable with these drinks and there's so many classics in here, you'll start to recognize how bartenders have branched out and just kind of swapped a sweet for something else or uh, maybe a more local fruit than just a gener a general lemon, something like that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I'll point out for those of you who you know who have the book or others who are who are considering it, um, it's split into uh, into sections based on style, and one of those styles is the sour. So you can see I've got my little sticky notes here, um, but you can be kind of see the the colors on the um, on the ed edges of the pages. So it's it's um, it's organized in six different sections, as I said, the one of them is sours. It's one of the largest sections. And there's, you know, all kinds of things in there from the daiquiri to margarita to a sidecar, obviously the whiskey sour. And the other thing that's that that is I think is nice and that I really was important to me as I was organizing the book is that not only are they grouped in the sours chapter, but then all whiskey sours are all kind of in the same section. So if you flip to page 148, you've got your classic classic whiskey sour. And then over the following, you know, four or five pages, you've got all these different variations on that theme that you can kind of start to explore. Um, so that's just sort of a, a tip for those of you who are browsing the book and, you know, looking for ways to discover new flavors that you might like based on something you knew you already know. Yeah. And that's something that's worked really well for me on cocktail menus is kind of the profile uh, approach to mm -hmm. what kind of mood you're in versus being so tied to like a specific brand or something you drink, you know, flip through a chapter kind of depending on, yeah, earlier in the day, something a little lighter, something more strong and stirred for a nightcap, but especially while we're home a lot or maybe our favorite bar is closed. It's definitely fun to uh, take your adventures at cocktail hour. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you know, that, that brings up something that I think is uh, it's one reason that I love cocktails, which is that they are such a reflection of this rich, you know, social history and really anthropology of cultures. It, as you said, Megan, the cocktail is a unique American 
culinary invention, one of our kind of only uh, true contributions to the, you know, to the food. Cocktails and, and barbecue. That's, that's what that's we right. should claim, I, mean, I think. <laughs> first, those are strong entries though. Like the, we're, we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, you know, going for quality over quantity. Um, well, that's one of the things that, that's really fun when you start getting into cocktails. And one of the things that was really fun for me in researching for this book was talking to people all over the world about th their local variations on, you know, as Megan said, me most cocktails really go back to a few kind of classic templates. And there's just sort of tweaked here and there at the edges with a local flavor or, you know, a different base spirit. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, actually, Adrian, if this started out as a global book mm -hmm. or it kind of evolved that way as you were doing research. It started out as a global book. So it's uh, spirited as part of a larger series of books from, from Fiden that they call their culinary Bible series. And oh, cool. um, yes, I'm a little, I've been asked before, you know, do I consider this a, you know, a, a cocktail Bible? And I, oh, I say that that I think my my Catholic school um, upbringing makes me a little uncomfortable to compare a book of cocktail recipes to a two thousand year old religious text, but um, <laughs> but it is it is meant to be comprehensive um, and 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 certainly global. And so the other um, some of the other books in this series include uh, there's one on bread, there's one for vegan food. Uh, just recently they came out with the Jewish cookbook, which is food from the Jewish diaspora. I actually have it in front of me on my, um, on my kitchen Island right now. So, so yeah, it was, it was originally designed to be a global book and there are 60 countries represented in the pages. I will say one of the best things about bar being a bartender is knowing other bartenders because we always have a friend in any city. So that's where I take all my recommendations from. So everyone's lucky to have a big book of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's wonderful how, how close knit the hospitality industry is. And, you know, when travel comes back again, uh, my first book was actually, it's called Where Bartenders Drink. It's a guide to global bars as recommended by bartenders. So for those of you who, you know, are not Megan and do not have your own personal network of bartender friends, you can pick up this book and get all of their recommendations, uh, including Megan's for her favorite bars, uh, which is definitely another, you know, at, in this lockdown virtual world that we're all living in, it's, it's nice to at least imagine a future where we might travel yes, and go to bars. Exactly. To person. Yeah. And similar with these recipes, don't just look at the recipes, but where they came from, or maybe the person they're attributed to, because that will definitely help your future travel plans. That's true. So Megan, let's talk about your whiskey sour variation that is mm -hmm. featured in the book and is a super delicious and I think very appropriate seasonal cocktail right now as we head into colder weather. And I also, I just love the name. It's called The Whiskey Business. Yes. For those of you um, following along in the book, it's on page 154. So tell us about this drink and how you, you know, how you came up with it. And then I think you're going to give us a little demo as well. Yes, I'm going to do a quick demo, mostly because I would love to have a whiskey business tonight. Um, so number one, can you believe no one took that name yet? I Googled several times. I always make sure a drink hasn't been published under a name that I think of first. Um, not always foolproof, but it worked. So number one, that name was not taken. Number two, I always, like I said earlier, I go back to these formulas for inspiration. I was working on the opening menu for Dear Irving. So this was 2014. Uh, spicy drinks are wildly popular. I'm sure everyone out there probably knows or has read a menu. Um, and it's also particularly challenging because spicy was not something that is part of like the classic canon of cocktails. Mm -hmm. it, I don't think these ingredients were widely available and they don't seem to be part of the palate at that time, but it definitely is now. So that's where we have to adjust for Ode to the 1800s, living in 2014 and beyond. So uh, Ancho Reyes, was new to the market at this point. Um, it's pretty label, put a little forward. So Ancho Reyes is 80 proof, but a liqueur. So it's kind of a balance of definitely adding a sweet element, but being as strong as like a vodka, gin, some bourbons. It is like a kind of chipotle roasted pepper flavor. And it is quite spicy on its own, but I kept finding once I put it in drinks, it kind of disappeared a little bit. So what is a fun challenge for me with drinks 
um, similar to cooking, but a much faster result is sometimes you have to find a way to like support the flavors you want. And when we're thinking about spirits, we're thinking about them as a backbone of the drink flavors we want to pull out. We're not just trying to put stuff on top so you don't taste it. It's really supposed to be, you know, the hero of the drink. So I use rye whiskey because I love that black pepper spice. I think that complemented the ancho chili, but also cinnamon I find really well, even though it's more of a baking spice for that kind of roasted pepper ancho chili, kind of lifted it up and a little bit of Angostura, can't go wrong. It's if you only had to have one bitter, that's the one to have. Kind of clove, allspice, again, just kind of was a supporting character to this ancho that I wanted to pull out. So I will make it quickly. So people have a reference if you wanna make this at home at some point. So not extra heavy, just a dash of Angostura, depending on what you're pouring it out of, you might need to be a little more generous. Uh, just half ounce of lemon in this and then half ounce of cinnamon. But again, going back to that ratio of equal sweet and equal sweet and citrus, and then you can always adjust for your personal taste. And then this is what we call a split base cocktail, which instead of doing two ounces of one spirit, we did one and one. So this Old Forester rye is 100 proof. This ancho is 80. So basically two full strength ounces just mixed up. And that's a fun way to play with things that you like, that you think might go together. Uh, like this time of year, apple brandy and bourbon, um, even aged rum and bourbon I love because of that extra little brown sugar No, It's very fun to play with flavors that are, you know, it's, it's quite nuanced when you get to spirits to taste it over the alcohol, but those little tiny compliments can be great to each other. So that was the Angostura, the lemon, the cinnamon, and then equal parts Ancho Reyes and rye whiskey. No egg white in this one. Just grab a little ice here. One, we do over one big cube, which if you have, you know, a silicone ice mold or something, it's great. It just melts a little slower. It lets you hang on to your drink. It's not really make or break, but it both looks good and serves a purpose. So I will shake this up real quick. Again, the main thing is to hear the ice hitting both sides of the tin. Make sure we're not missing any of our cocktail on the top there. And then for the garnish on this, I do a lemon wheel with just a little dusting of ancho chili or red pepper if you had some, just anything that's gonna kind of complement those aromatics there. And again, a little color contrast because what you see and what you smell will definitely affect what you are tasting. So that's the whiskey business. You can find it at my bars or in the book. Cheers. I definitely wish that I had Megan here with me to make <laughs> one of those for me to drink, but I will hit yeah. myself with my, with my own whiskey sour. In this new um, world, I'm really, um, I'm winning at all these events. <laughs> <laughs> so Megan, we, you mentioned a couple of times, and I think it's worth talking a little bit about ice. And you said mm -hmm. something that is, we usually don't think about, which is that ice was actually a you know, a luxury product and, and very well, ex expensive and rare uh, when cocktails were first coming into being before refrigeration, they actually had to bring ice up usually from uh, probably from, I know that they brought it up from South America. So like big, you know, ships would go down to South America, cut these huge ice blocks and then l bring them back up north to supply bars in San Francisco or in New York City. So obviously we are very blessed that we no longer have to contend with that. We just make, make it in the freezer. Uh, yes. But it is also, you know, another thing we, we often don't think about is that um, water from the melting ice when you shake it or stir the cocktail is in fact an ingredient in the recipe. It, is, it isn't just a, um, like an accident. Um, it's like, it's, it's an ingredient and you can end up, you know, a quarter to a third of your final drink can actually be wa melted ice, melted water from your, your shaking or stirring ice. So it's, 
you know, at the same way that you are going to use fresh lemon juice and, you know, and a good quality bourbon, you should also be using good quality ice. Yes, as much as possible. Um, because, you know, sometimes a cocktail is a cocktail, but I always kind of equate it to um, when you get ice at a hotel and you want to like put a bottle of champagne on ice or something and it's kind of a plastic bag of water pretty soon. That's because it's small and it's not dense. So it's going to melt really fast. So the bigger, denser the ice is, the longer it will stay um, ice really. So like when we use these bigger cubes, the cold draft cubes, um, you can also buy silicone molds that are about this size. When you shake with them, they're not gonna totally break down and like just kind of be water, like shaking with hotel ice probably would be. Um, but they will give off a little water. They will change the temperature. So that's great. And then if you pour it over this, this big rock is gonna melt very, very slowly. So my drink is gonna stay cold, but I can definitely chat, you know, have a conversation with whoever I'm with and go back and forth to it. So it really lets you hold on to your drink a little bit longer. And, you know, when you're paying New York prices for drinks, you probably want it to last a little bit. Um, so yeah, I think a great little home bar investment is those little silicone trays for your old fashions or even some nicer ice for a Tom Collins, mm -hmm. just to keep the integrity good, keep it tasting as, as you meant to for as long as possible. Yeah, I totally agree. I think ice is, is very important. There's actually, for those of you who want to, you know, get into it a little more, who want recommendations on like what kind of ice to shake with or stir with, there's a, an essay in the book called why ice matters. And, and so you can kind of get into a little bit, a little bit more there, but definitely those silicone ice trays are not expensive and, and a great addition to your bar. Speak and I'm always jealous of people in the suburbs with the crushed ice part of their fridge. <laughs> or oh, <freezer>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, what about, you know, Megan, one of the things in addition to obviously like what kind of ice you use is uh, we often get questions about what, what kind of spirits, like sort of how nice of a spirit should you choose for a cocktail versus what should you choose, what should you save for sipping? So tell us your kind of rule of thumb there. Yeah. So I always think my kind of rule for cocktail hour is that it should not stress you out. So that price point for everyone is a little bit different. Um, and if you you know, want to use Johnny Walker Blue in your Rob Roy's and that makes you feel good, go for it. If you have like a nice single malt, when you open it, it should be fun. It should be with people that it doesn't stress you out to pour it. And if you end up drinking the whole bottle because it's really fun, like it should just be really fun. It shouldn't be stressful. Yes, that price point can be very different for people. Um, but in, in a general sense, um, you know, we use a lot of what's called premium well, which is like your beef eater, your uh, Buffalo Trace bourbon, Elijah Craig, kind of a on the high end of that. Tangare is like a benchmark that I love. Um, so, you know, not a plastic bottle on the bottom at the liquor shelf, but you know, 25 to $35, you can get great spirits for that. Mm -hmm. I always say the more information a bottle gives you, kind of the more you can trust it or feel good about it. And by that, I mean, where is it made? Does it have a distiller's name on it? Does it have a year or like a hundred percent agave, something like that. The more information a bottle gives you, the more pride they take in it, probably the more special or singular it is. So that's, that's a good rule of thumb for me. And I like to read the stories on the back. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. And I, you know, the, I like to save those for me, I like to save those more expensive bottlings if I'm just going to have something kind of neat over ice yeah. or maybe in an old fashioned where you are really going to be able to appreciate more of the nuance than you would in a sour or in some other cocktails. Yeah. And I also think, I always say like, I always have champagne in my fridge, big rule. Uh, yeah. But also you want to have something like for the good days and the bad days. And I always have like just uh, Balveni Caribbean cask is my favorite, like a nice single malt. It's like, I just had a day and I need a little moment for me. Mm -hmm. I like to celebrate, but also it can be comforting. So it's nice to treat yourself above yeah. all sometimes. I have to say in March, when everything was, was coming down the lockdowns, um, we went through all of the McAllen in our house yeah. very quickly. <laughs> yeah. It, it is a time to treat yourself. Don't yeah. wait. Appreciate if you got it. That's what I think. <laughs> yeah, we, we depleted the scotch and, you know, then had to go, had to go replenish and sort of move on to other things. So where I, I feel also like think it's a great way. Um, 
sorry, just to talk about travel sometimes, like I have a great bottle of Pisco that I brought back from Peru. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes if you have people over, it's a great way to like broach a new kind of conversation or memory. So um, that's also a good reason to keep some spirits around. Yes, and since you mentioned Pisco, because this is one of the recipes that we also featured in our, you know, if, when you signed up, you hopefully received yesterday that your PDF with your recipes. And so the Pisco Sour is another very classic cocktail. I know we have at least one person who's got one in their glass right now. Excellent. And that is an, ex, you know, that's obviously it's a sour, but with Pisco as the base. Um, that is a, a fun cocktail because the, well, as many of the, our classics, uh, have the same uh, situation where there's there's sort of competing origin stories, if you will. Um, Pisco was really popular in San Francisco because of the trade between uh, California, modern day California and South America, in particular Peru. And so the Pisco Sour was, you know, maybe created in San Francisco or maybe created in Lima, Peru. Those There's sort of an argument about that. Megan, I don't know if you have an opinion. Um, I wasn't there, so <laughs> everyone has to remember about cocktail histories that people were drinking. So it's sometimes a good story that's not that reliable. Is, uh, <laughs> that is an excellent point. That is, <laughs> um, so the the you know the the pisco brandy became a huge hit up in San Francisco, um, thanks to that to that trade that was happening, and uh, and you know wherever it was created, many many of them were drunk across the bars in you know in San Francisco. Uh, kind of around um, that, uh, like the right after the gold rush, kind of those heyday years when there was a lot of money flowing. San Francisco was a booming city. There were these big, sort of glossy, beautiful hotel bars. Uh, so it's you're, you know, when you're drinking that, you're also you're drinking definitely a, you know, a piece of history, which is which is really fun. Yes, I had, they make so many Pisco Sours in Lima that usually they make them in blenders with the egg white and they're like super fluffy and frothy and cold. And it is like a big part of my memory of traveling there. And I do think Pisco is underrated. So if you're feeling adventurous, buy a bottle. I am definitely with you. And, you know, one of the things that you can do with Pisco, uh, if you know, if you buy a bottle and you want to kind of experiment with it, is it's a really great substitute actually for a lot of for vodka and a lot of cocktails. It's got some of those more like fruity flower notes. Mm -hmm. um, there's also in the in the back of the book, there is an index by spirit. So you can flip to that index and check out, you know, all the recipes that call for Pisco to kind of give you some inspiration. So <clears throat> Megan, one of the other things that we wanted, I wanted to talk about with you is, you know, kind of this uh, idea of how to explore cocktails. You know, if you like the whiskey sour, then like, what are some other things that you could try? And obviously, you know, as we talked about, there's many, many variations on the whiskey sour where you're tweaking this ingredient or that ingredient. Um, there's other, sour. you know, you can use other spirits. You could try the Pisco sour. But what are some other directions that you might point people in if they come to you and say, I like a whiskey sour, but I want to try something different? Yeah. So sometimes I talk to them about what they particularly like about their favorite whiskey. You know, is it the kind of black pepper spice of a rye? Do they find bourbon really comforting? And then, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I love whiskey sours, but I'm just a little bit bored of it or it's coming becoming a bit sweet to me because mm -hmm. um, people's palates do change. I still love the classics as the kind of, you know, box we're looking at, but like the old fashioned is one of my favorite formulas to mess around with because there's so many cool bitters on the market. You know, again, just like a teaspoon or a sugar cube of something uh, on the sweet side, but it's really about the spirit. So that's also how a lot of bartenders judge a spirit. If, if, you know, we have a couple bottles of whiskey, we'll make old fashions and see what is our favorite thing about it. When I get a new tequila, the first thing I do is make a margarita. Mm -hmm. But what we're always trying to do is like pull out or compliment uh, something about a spirit. So if you really love a spirit and you're looking to be more adventurous, take a couple seconds to think about what do you really like about it? Is it that little citrus peel? Is it like that orange note from Beef Eater? Is it the floral part of Pisco and say, you know, what's around me? What can I buy to complement that and like amp it up? And it's a little bit like cooking, but you get a drink at the end. So it's very fun. 
<laughs> and little things you have around your kitchen. Again, like tea. Um, I use a lot of tea and drinks, honey, um, little fun salts. Like there's all kinds of ways to just amp up the flavor of, but think about what you like out of that spirit and mm -hmm. find a way to complement it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great advice. And it seems like we've got some really adventurous drinkers in attendance tonight. For example, we've got Dan who says he likes to make a mezcal and ancho rays sour with egg mm. white, which sounds delicious. I would like to have that. Uh, maybe next. Um, or yeah, using lily koi, uh, passion fruit is another, you know, that is a great way to kind of eat, turn something into a, in, into sort of the tropical direction. And you can do yeah. that with delicious and a pisco sour in, in other kinds of sours. Um, and kind of adding that, that, that really uh, dramatic uh, flavor kind of flavor profile is a really fun way to kind of really change the direction of a drink and give it a, a new perspective. Definitely. I like to give my favorite flavors, like, you know, you have a tea or a fruit or something you love and think about what would be the spirit backbone if I was not gonna eat this fruit, but put it in a drink or not gonna drink this tea, but well, drink it, but in a, in a more fun way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What, Megan, what are some ways that you are using tea in cocktails? Are you using actually like brewed tea or are you infusing spirits with, with loose tea? Um, so it can really work both ways, but for the most part, we would use it like brew a tea, like jasmine is one of my favorite flavors. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about some certain gins is like that kind of floral note. Mm -hmm. um, so we brew a jasmine tea and we use that water as the simple syrup water. So that's a really easy way, you know, just equal parts, one cup, uh, tea water, one cup sugar, mm -hmm. make sure it's a little warm so you can stir it. Um, so that's an easy way to do it. You definitely can, especially white spirits infuse like really easily. Tequila and vodka are probably the most popular ways to do it. And for the most part, tea is very fast. So you could let some loose tea. And I always go for like nicer tea because it's so much more aromatic when I'm um, doing an infusion or a syrup. I think it makes a big difference. Um, you know, and just check it every few minutes, but that flavor is going to come through pretty fast. I do say for infusing spirits, always make it a little bit stronger than you think, or like a little spicier than you think, because you are going to mix it with other things and you want it to stand up at the end of the day against the soda or citrus or whatever. Yeah. I will say that one of my very favorite cocktails and, and actually the first great cocktail that I ever had was the Earl Grey Martini which is mm -hmm. created by Audrey Saunders in New York. I'm looking for it in the book. I'm not sure exactly which page it's on, but I definitely recommend that to anyone who's who's a fan of Earl Grey. That's why I ordered it on the menu. I'd never, you know, I was totally lost when I arrived at this bar. I had never had a, you know, a classic or delicious cocktail before, but I knew that I liked Earl Grey. And so I was like, great, that's, you know, done. I'll have yeah. that one. Um, it's, I just found that it's on page 140. And so what it's made with gin, with Earl Grey infused gin and, and Audrey Saunders, who's a, a, an incredible bartender was at the time trying to kind of bring back gin because nobody was drinking it. And so this was, was one of the drinks that she, that she used to do that. And I have been hooked on that cocktail. It was also obviously my introduction to egg white cocktails, which as I said, I love. So I definitely highly recommend that as, as a, you know, a, a kind of a fun direction to take things if, if you're into tea. Yeah, I love that one. And it's one of the first uh, kind of like modern classics, you know, like, again, mm -hmm. taking this formula, updating it with techniques and things that are more available to us than they were before. Yeah, absolutely. With that said, Megan, what are there some recipes, you know, either they could be in this book, or maybe they're not, but what are some drinks that you think are whether it's a sort of a forgotten classic or maybe just an overlooked drink that you think that people should be paying more attention to? Yes. Well, I actually was very happy to see it in the book because my answer always to overlooked classics is the 20th century. Mm -hmm. It is so stinking good. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of, you could classify it in the sour category because it has some citrus and some sweet. It's a gin-based cocktail, but there's a mix of lillet and a little bit of creme de cacao that just kind of makes this ambrosia kind of almost lightly desserty, but it, then it has the fresh lemon. So it's not too sweet, like mm -hmm. just really delicious. That's what I think of when I think of 
we're making cocktails to make a brand new flavor and not to layer things. Um, so the 20th century is just always one of my favorites. And I, I kind of like it being my little back pocket secret, but if it was on more menus, I would be happy with that too. <laughs> Fair enough. And that is on page 226. For those of you following along, I did put it in the Sours chapter. So I'm glad that Megan agrees. Looks like oh, have I have another 20th century fan out there. Yeah, and also please. sidecars. I saw that in the chat. Great this time mm -hmm. of year, especially with like a little touch of like cinnamon or brown sugar, you know, like you can really make those seasonal as well. Yeah, absolutely. I also, you know, so f a fun fact is the 20th century is named for a train that ran between New York and Chicago um, in the early mid 20th century. And it was like the height of luxury, this you know, this train. And the, so that was the kind of the, um, you know, the inspiration for this, for this cocktail was this very like luxurious travel experience. Um, and there was even, uh, uh, they had a, this whole advertising series, um, where there was a young woman dressed in beautiful white clothes. This was the age of coal. And so it was very dirty to travel on the railroad. And this, this luxury, you know, train, uh, their like mm. marketing message was, look, you can wear all white and still arrive pristine at your destination, which I love as, as a, you know, as a visual, these kind of vintage advertisements. Yeah. yeah. And there's also in, then in the book, a variation on the 20th century called the 19th century, which ironically was created in the 21st century. <laughs> but like you know, I said, cocktail history, you know, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so that's something, you know, something else that you can, uh, that you can experiment with as well. Um, I have to say that one of that my kind of favorite lesser known, uh, cocktail, well, as a, as a genre are vermouth and sherry cocktails. Mm. Um, when I was writing this book, as I was experimenting with a lot of recipes and, um, at, well, and I was having to, you know, try a lot of different cocktails. I also ironically um, stopped drinking for a while while I was writing this book. And then I was kind of trying to pare down my alcohol consumption, which, you know, other people may be in the same boat as well. And that's something that I really like about vermouth and, and sherry because you can have really complex flavors uh, and you can have a really high quality cocktail experience, but you don't have to have such a large quantity of a very high proof spirit, you can, you know, you can have a sort of a, a lower dose, if you will. Um, so my, and one of my very favorites in that category is the bamboo. It's a bartender um, favorite as well, the bamboo. Which is, which is a dry vermouth and fino sherry, equal parts, two dashes of orange bitters and a lemon twist. It's on page 324. Um, and you can also, you can substitute different kinds of, of vermouth, different kinds of sherry. You can kind of go like all these different, you know, directions there. Um, there's a whole section of, of that sort of low proof, um, low proof spirit forward cocktails in the book. And that was something that I really enjoyed exploring and really wanted to include because it's, it's true that while all of us, you know, might be able or love a great cocktail, we might not want to drink four of them in a row that, that might not like work out so well for us the next day. So doing something, you know, lower proof is a nice, uh, a nice way to, to, you know, to mix it up and still be able to participate. I couldn't agree more. Sure. looks like we've got some other, mm -hmm. some other fans of low proof cocktails on the line as well. Um, and actually one of the things that I've been experimenting with recently is uh, no proof cocktails. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole range of zero proof or sort of spirit, uh, alcohol-free spirits coming onto the market. Seed lip is definitely the most well-known that they're sort of a gin substitute, but there are tons of other ones. And that's something that, that I've been exploring and really getting into. And it's, it's, it's again, really nice if you're, if you're not drinking, but you still want to have a great cocktail, still want to participate in happy hour. It's really nice that there's now more choices that we can be more inclusive so that everybody can, can, have a great time and, you know, not feel left out. Yeah. I think something that I've been seeing more of, which I like is the zero proof or non-alcoholic cocktails still having names, you know, so you can just order it off the menu instead of either looking for like just a soda or having to have like a conversation, like it's just very easy. I'll have the ginger mule and, you know, it might not 
people might not even know if it's alcohol or not because you know sometimes people ask a lot of questions yeah well that's a great point especially when you're in a social setting it can be a little bit sometimes it can be uncomfortable if you if you aren't drinking and you don't want to invite a lot of uh, commentary from the peanut gallery about why are you not drinking? Uh, you know, for, for me personally, usually people go, Oh, are you pregnant? I'm like, no, thanks so much for asking a very personal question. I don't even know you at happy hour. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, and there, you know, there's so many reasons why people, you know, might not be drinking. Um, but often it's kind of met with a little bit of like a, Oh, you know, a side eye or like a follow on you know, question. And I think that it's, it's really nice to be able to go into many bar. Well, maybe not go into the bar, but order online. Uh, we can, there's still, we can still go into some bars Yeah. Uh, but to go into a bar and be able to order off the menu and not like make a big scene about it. Um, or even, you know, have people over to your home or, or go out to someone, somebody else's home and be able to, to have a drink that looks like everyone else's and, and doesn't, you know, make you feel like you're missing out or you're stuck with a glass of water or like juice because now I'm not five. I still want you know, <laughs> I not be drinking, but I still want yeah. beverage. So Great. completely. So I think we're, you know, we're happy to take some questions. I've seen a couple in the chat. If you, if people have other questions you want to put in the Q and a box as well, we can start taking those. I saw one, um, let me go back to the beginning, Megan, a couple for you. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the great iconic cocktails have all been invented? Do you dream of inventing the new martini or 20th century, uh, or Negroni? Um, so that is a great question. And I love part of what I love about classic cocktails is the idea that they have started somewhere and they've traveled, which is also why I'm kind of particular about how I name drinks because I do want them to live on in a way, like maybe not, I don't know if they'll ever be as global as a Negroni, but you know, so I try not to do like too many pop references or like kind of puns that won't travel Mm -hmm. as well. So, um, you know, Pearl Collins, whiskey business, um, you know, I try to do some like names that people can say, remember, can travel on. So that's one part of it. Um, but yes, I mean, I think it's, I, I still think A, their people's palates change over the years. So things become popular or like spicy drinks, for example, like mm-hmm. I do think some of these drinks will kind of live on as modern classics because A, they did not exist. It's a big part of people's palates. Um, but it, I just love the like idea of them starting at Deer Irving in New York City and like slowly working their way around the world. And like books are part of that, Instagram, people talking about them, but it's the idea that you've had a drink that you can't stop thinking about. So you're gonna have someone else make that instead of like ordering something else. It's a huge compliment to a bartender. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then a follow on to that, what is your opinion of the hard shake of uh, from Kazuo Ueda, who's a Japanese bartender? Yeah. So. It's beautiful. <laughs> like part of, I think why you go out and what we've all probably noticed, including myself who can make a lot of drinks. I'm like, I cannot wait to pay for someone to make me a drink. Like it's part of going out. It's part of the experience. Um, so I think like it goes with the, like the whole vibe of how those bars operate. Um, and tell us, Megan, will you tell oh, yeah. for those who don't know what the hard shake is, what it is? Yeah, so it's very popular in Japan and they use those smaller cobbler shakers and they kind of hold them here and they have basically like a five point system of like a diamond that kind of goes around. And what they want is the height, the ice to hit like not even back and forth, but kind of like the corners of the sh- of the shaker. So it's like this real aeration. Um, I don't really know the science behind it. I do know that, yes, you need that aeration and like, yes, you need that effort. And if that system kind of helps you and it probably helps train people as well. Like if everyone is doing it the same way, like you're going to have a consistent product. So I work a little bit differently. Whereas I look at the end result from the bartender and as long as they can get there, the kind of individual style, I just feel like that's maybe a little more New York city or American. Like as long as you get there, how it looks isn't exactly as important. Um, But it does technically make sense and it is beautiful to watch. Yeah, I think that goes back to, you know, your comment too about, about what kind of ice you're going to use. Like in the end, cocktails are about having fun. It shouldn't be like hugely stressful. And 
you know, oh, I did the shaking wrong, like now I have to start over. Um, you know, I uh, have enjoyed many cocktails and made many co that other people have made, and I've made you know many of my own cocktails and and uh, you know while and I, I so like you, I really appreciate that beautiful technique that many of the Japanese bartenders bring to it. But you know, particularly in a home bartending setting, I wouldn't worry about it too much. <laughs> Um, so a good, good question from Dan, uh, are most of these drink names universal? If I like a drink in the book and I go to a nicer cocktail bar, will they know how to make it? So that is a great question. The answer is it depends. So for the, the drinks that are really a part of the kind of classic canon, and you can, you can tell what many of those are by the, the time period that's listed next to the recipe. So, um, on each, beside each recipe, see if I can get this to, to show here, um, right underneath the, the name of the drink, I specify where is it from, if that's known, and then what kind of time period is it from. So most of the drinks that were created pre-prohibition or the 1920s to the 1940s, those drinks are going to be, if you go into a, a high quality cocktail bar, they should be familiar with those recipes. Um, but, you know, some of the more like modern classics or more regional specialties, those you know, those might not be drinks that that any bartender, you know, knows how to make or kind of can, you know, can pull out of a hat. Um, and if I can add to that, if you love a drink and you, um, you know, you have a photo of it or something, I'm always excited to make a new drink if someone comes in with it. So I think sometimes people are intimidated to ask for things or um, feel like uh, my my mixology friends can be a little intimidating sometimes, but especially if it's like, oh, I went on this trip and I made this drink, or if it's special to like an anniversary or a birthday, like I wanna make it, I wanna learn it, I wanna make your night better. So I would say the only time it gets confusing with bartenders is when people know a drink name and they kind of actually don't know anything else about it. So, <laughs> it, you know, it's it could have just been like something that was on a menu somewhere, but if it's like a cool drink that people are starting to get to know, I want to know it too. Yeah, hundred percent. All right. Let's see. Um, so if there are any other questions, I think, um, okay, let's see. Oh, there's a bunch. Um, in this age of Zoom, what is a good cocktail where the Zoom participants have different spirits at home, but want the shared experience? So I would say that actually a sour is perfect for that because you can use literally any base spirit along with, with a citrus and a sweetener. And so that the, like the, the really simple um, sour template is the first recipe in that chapter. It's on page 132. And I list, this is another thing that I, that I wanna sort of point out of the, out, about the book and is something that's kind of fun as you're exploring on your own is especially for some of the really classic recipes, I list different variation ideas for ways that you can, you can experiment and add different flavors. So the classic sour, two ounces of your spirit of choice, three quarter ounces, fresh lemon juice, three quarter ounces, simple syrup. And then some of the other things that you can add to that would be you could do lime juice instead of lemon. You could do a combination of lime and lemon, which is what is in the classic Pisco Sour. You can muddle a, a few seasonal fruit slices or berries, which Megan mentioned earlier for the whiskey sour as well. You could use an herb syrup or a berry syrup. And the recipes for all the syrups are in the front part of the book. So if you need instructions for that, you can, you can look there. Uh, you can use jam. That's actually one of my favorites. You can use like a teaspoon of raspberry jam or apricot jam. Um, to, to add that, that kind of fruit flavor. And it's a fun, you know, it's like a very easy, easy to, you, most people have some jam in their pantry. Um, you can substitute a flavored liqueur for all or part of the simple syrup. So like that would be, you know, Cointreau or Maraschino or uh, like a, you know, a um, black currant cassis or like a, you know, any, any kind of fruit, fruit liqueur. Um, or, or, you know, like some combination of all of those things. So I would say that sours are definitely a great place to start. Megan, do you have other suggestions? Um, yeah, sometimes just, it kind of depends how separate people are, but like mm -hmm. sometimes just a theme is good. So like a mule very simply is, or a buck is ginger beer, a spirit and lime. And really it tastes good with everything. You almost can't go wrong. Yeah. 
or you can have kind of like, I'm a gin and tonic girl, you know, like everybody just have a gin and tonic. It doesn't matter like where or what, or everybody bring a local beer, you know, and then it's kind of a conversation point too of like, what did you have? Where do you live? Um, especially if people are spread out. Sometimes it's just like, bring your favorite something to the party. And then it's a good reason to chat too. Cause sometimes online, it's like, you need a little something to loosen it up. So sometimes the theme around cocktails can just be a, a fun way to start. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, here's a question for you, Megan. Um, how can you best incorporate kefir limes into drinks? So I have seen that a few ways, um, is both, I believe people use the leaves. It's not something I have a lot of experience with, but people definitely like infuse with them. Uh, you can buy Tangeray Rangpur and that will have done it for you. Or yep. um, there's definitely actually bitters that I've seen. I, I can't like co-sign, I haven't had them, but um, uh, I think it's kind of depending where you live, if you could actually find them. Um, Cause even in New York where I kind of see everything, it's not something I see a lot or find like Tangeray Rangpur, something that uses that as a main ingredient would also be a fun way. Um, almost like yuzu, you know, find something. Mm -hmm. You don't see it a lot, but you can definitely find that flavor. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, all right. So let's see. I, I, I just discovered the additional questions that everyone's asking and we have a ton of them, which is amazing. So we might not be able to get to all of these, but we will, you know, we'll look at making a dent in it. So, uh, Megan, we just, a, like a sort of a clarification, um, question, will you review the ice that you used to make the, the sours show folks what size you used for shaking mm -hmm. and then the size that you used in the glass? Cause they are different sizes. Yeah. So a cold draft cube is like, I would say like kind of one and a half by one and a half. Like it's just a big solid cube. This comes from an ice machine that we have, but you can definitely buy silicone molds that are the same size, but they're definitely denser than a freezer ice cube. Mm -hmm. This is what's called a two by two cube, which like we buy. So they're super clear from an ice studio. Um, it's like hard to even see because it's so clear. <laughs> I can put it on this. Um, my little ice diamond. Um, but again, like a silicone mold, you can buy in the same size. And people always ask about making clear ice. It's kind of a whole, like the way your freezer freezes is why your ice is not clear because the minerals go to the middle instead of going to the top, like a lake, where is ice used to come from. Mm -hmm. So you can definitely go down a huge internet rabbit hole of making clear ice in your freezer. Yeah. Um, but also it, it is a nice, definitely touch but again I, I wouldn't say it's kind of essential depending on like how into it you are yeah I'm I'm with you I've gone down that <laughs> internet rabbit hole and it's kind of fun but uh ultimately like not something that I would spend my time doing yeah um what about okay so someone wants to know did I sample everything in the book at at one point or another yes so for those of you keeping track, that's 610 nice job. cocktail <laughs> recipes. Um, one of my favorite uh, uh, like periods or sort of maybe like the fun, it was actually, I enjoyed it and it was funny. Um, so when I was testing some of the, the recipes in the punch chapter, which are also very nice and seasonal and something I would, another overlooked, frankly, cat category that I think is super fun is wassail, which is uh, a medieval age English uh, drink. It's mulled ale or mulled hard cider. So you basically take, you know, hard cider or, or kind of a, like a brown, um, sort of typical English style beer. You are going to mull it with like cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, orange peel a little on the stove. And then you, uh, just to serve, you serve it with baked apples and you add some Oloroso sherry and it is so delicious. It's also pretty low alcohol. Um, and, uh, I was test, I, for whatever reason, I was testing those, those really wintry recipes in August when it was over a hundred degrees here where I live in Napa, California, my husband was, you know, working outside, like working up a sweat in the, in the yard. And I'm like, honey, do you want to come taste my mold beer? And he's like, no, <laughs> 
what happened to my ties? I really preferred the like frozen <laughs> tropical <laughs> drinks. Why are you making, you know, Christmas beverages in the middle of the summer? Um, but it, uh, for, for right now, they are in fact seasonal. And I definitely recommend checking out some of those recipes, which are, they're in, so they're in the punch chapter, which is the, the pink chapter at the um, pages at the end of the book. Um, wassail is on page 414. And another really fun one is lamb's wool, which is a which is similar to a wassail, just kind of a you know another variation on that theme. And those both those all come with some really fun historical stories, which I always love. Um, ooh, let, okay. So Roland wants to know what is the best cocktail for those who enjoy a dry red wine. Megan, what oh. do you think about this? I well. The first thing that came to mind was the bamboo actually, oh. because like you get, I think what wine drinkers sometimes miss from cocktails is like the acidity and not the acidity of like a lemon cause that's quite different. But so something like a Palo Cortado is, um, mm. you know, it's not as dry. I find Fino like a little bit too intense. Sometimes it's like so dry, mm -hmm. but um, so I love a bamboo with like Palo Cortado sherry and a little Blanc vermouth. So having like an aromatic wine, um, especially like a rouge or rosé um, in a cocktail, I think would please a lot of wine drinkers for like those kind of herbal layers, but also the acidity that's so great about good wine. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. There are also a bunch of recipes in the book that do call for red wine. Um, uh, you know, sangria obviously being being one of them, you're definitely adding sweetness there. So it's not necessarily dry. Um, but uh, another thing, you know, maybe to try out there would be some of the sweet vermouth style cocktails. So getting into like Dubonnet, which is a fortified, um, fortified wine, though some of those will give you some of those similar fruit notes of the wine and they're not they're not overly fruity they definitely have or not overly sweet they do have a little bit of sweetness but Dubonnet was actually an ingredient that I had not really experienced before doing my research for this book and it's now one of our we my husband and I both really enjoyed experimenting with it and uh, and stock it now in the house how very royal of you <laughs> so royal yes Dubonnet is a favorite of uh, Queen Elizabeth and the late Queen Mother <laughs> so yeah, very, very refined. Um, a good question about, uh, you know, what to do if you don't have a shaker. So can you use a whisk? So I would actually recommend, and Megan, you can chime in as well if you've got other tips, but I would recommend using like a mason jar mm -hmm. um, is, a, is a really good kind of makeshift, um, makeshift shaker. You want the, the reason a, a whisk is not, a whisk will work if you're trying to get an egg white frothy, but to, to have ice in the drink and get it to actually dilute correctly, you really want to, like you really need to shake it uh, in order to, to make that happen. Yeah, I would say a mason jar is great because also you can drink right out of it at the end. Um, but also if you have two like kind of pint glasses or heavy duty or glasses, like you can kind of throw a drink in between, but I would say um, it maybe needs a little more uh, movement than a whisk, although that would definitely be better than kind of not having a shaking option at all. Yeah. 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 I totally agree. And there's actually, um, there's an essay on that in the book as well called Home Bartending Hacks, which is on page 345. And I address some of those things like if you don't have you know, a jigger, then you can use measuring spoons. If you don't have a bar spoon, you can use a chopstick. Um, you know, and uh, if you don't feel like taking the time to make, um, you know, uh, like berry syrup where you're heating the berries and, and mixing it with simple syrup, you can just like muddle a few berries in the cocktail shaker beforehand. So that's a nice uh, reference if you're looking for, for some of those shortcuts. Um, Eric wants to know what got me started in my deep interest in cocktails. So it, it was, as I was saying earlier, that first night out at, um, at Pegu club in New York, which was one of the first great cocktail bars that, that brought cocktails back part of that cocktail Renaissance that really started in kind of the early two thousands. And that was, you know, I, I went to, to Pegu club, tried the Earl Grey martini. It was like blue, totally blew my mind. 
Then we went to Milk and Honey, which is, you know, uh, not too far away. That was a, another really iconic New York bar that, that started this, this movement. And there I tried a Gold Rush, which is a whiskey sour variation with honey, well, another one of my favorites. And I just never looked back. And I, I, um, I was working in finance when I graduated. I graduated from college. I, I went to work in financial services. And I decided in my kind of, you know, four years into that job that I wanted to, I wanted to do something else. And I, so I made a list of things that I was passionate about and interested in. And it was like cocktails, travel, you know, food. And I'm looking at this list going, well, I don't know how I'm going to make a career out of any of these things that mostly just sounds like very expensive tastes that I'm going to have to get another job to like finance, you know, my interests. But once I started to, to really think about it and, you know, people like, like Megan uh, in the bar industry in New York were so inspirational to me because I saw these, these people who were making a career out of, out of cocktails and out of their passion. And so I, you know, said, okay, well, I can do that too. And, you know, fast forward 10 years and, uh, and, and I've now written two books on the subject, which still kind of flabbergasts no one more than me. Uh, and it's been really just such a, such an honor to be able to work on these books and to be able to, to collaborate with people like Megan, who I, you know, who I so admire and who have done so much work and have, have so much passion and creativity. And that's really, that's really what's reflected in this book. I mean, it's, it's, you know, none of this book would not be possible without all of the work that's, that's been done by, by all these incredible bartenders and, and of course, other, other writers and researchers. So Megan, how did you get into, um, to cocktails? So, um, kind of a few different ways. My mom always worked in restaurants when I was young. Uh, my first job was decorating ice cream cakes. And then I moved up to the hard stuff, but you know, my kind of sappy answer to all of this is always like, I think bars are magic. Like I think with like maybe some alcohol, maybe just some other kind of drink, but like music and lights and like, they're kind of like an adult haven. And I just thrive off that energy. Like I love the creativity of like mixing drinks and adding it together. But I also love the like, just crushing it on someone's anniversary night or like a first date that goes really well, or, you know, someone coming in because they decided they need a new job and like, they just need to blow off some steam or something. Like I just, I really never get tired of that energy of being in a bar. Yeah. Yeah. There's something really, really special about that. And I, I think that um, when, you know, when, when any of us think about a time when we've a you know, memorable experience in a bar or in a restaurant, it for sure, it's the, we might remember the actual food or the actual drink, but so much of that experience is shaped by the, the ambiance and the people who serve it to you. And you can have a really technically well executed, you know, dish or, or drink. And it's just not as it's, it, it might be totally not memorable and like not fun. Um, whereas if you have really great service and a really wonderful ambiance, you will, you will have a much fonder memory of that, of that experience, even if maybe the drink wasn't technically as perfect. I think. I think um, we are getting a little, um, internet last call from <laughs> going over time. Oh, we, oh, we sure are because there's so many, so many good questions. And of course I'm like not even paying attention to my, <laughs> to the, to the folks, you know, calling last call. So, um, let's see, I'm just going to pick, we could do a little rapid fire if there's like three easier ones or shorter ones. I don't want to say. Um, easy. well, I tell you, this is one I just la la um, saw that I think is a great rapid fire question. So what cocktail would you make to impress a date? Ooh, so I do think like it has to be something you like. Don't just pick something because you saw it in a movie and you're going to like choke on it halfway mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think like a little story or something about you is great. Like, um, you know, you went to Kentucky and you have this bottle of bourbon or like your dad, like your first drink when you graduated was your dad bought you a Manhattan. You know, there's like little touchstones that like, especially if you're on a first date, you need a conversation avenue, right? Mm -hmm. So like, how can you tie into like, 
oh, I had this drink in Barcelona. Like, I'm going to try to make it for you. But it's like a cute effort at least, right? Like, um, so I think something about what, take a few seconds to be like, what do I really like? What flavor do I like? Do a little research on either like where you're going or what you're going to make because, you know, I'm a single girl and a little effort goes a long way, let me tell you. So I think, you know, those few extra minutes of like, okay, I want to have this drink, but also what am I going to say about it? Like, did I have it before? Is it because I love American whiskey? Is it because my dad got me into scotch? You know, there's a lot of avenues, but conversation and cocktails are like best friends. (laughs) (laughs) Well said. So we've got a couple of questions about Thanksgiving cocktails as well, which I think makes sense to touch on at least briefly um, since that Mm -hmm. holiday is coming up. Um, So I would say... I have sort of two sort of category uh, recommendations and then Megan, I wanna hear from you. So one would be a a sparkling, like a champagne cocktail, because I think it's fun to start out with that, um, you know, earlier in the day. So you can go with a a really classic champagne cocktail, which is super simple. Uh, Champagne, a sugar cube uh, doused with Angostura bitters. And that's also a nice kind of opens up the palate, kind of gets you, you know, in the mood for the day. And another category would be more kind of, and those sparkling cocktails are actually the first, the very first cocktails in the book in the refreshing section. Um, The the first kind of few pages are all all champagne and sparkling cocktails. And then the other category that I would take a look at are more kind of the digestif uh, category. So some of those those Amaros, which is the uh, Italian for bitter. So things like um, Fernet Branca, Amaro Montenegro, uh, Amaro Maletti, those are really good for, for digestion as the the term digestif suggests. So after your big meal, if you're looking for something to kind of like pave the way for dessert or maybe for seconds, um, that's another, another kind of area that you can look into And that, uh, in the book, you can look at the section of the, of the Negroni that will get you into that kind of bitter um, you know, bitter world, which is on page 308. And then there's also, um, on 324 starts the kind of really the, the bitter digestif section. There's a few examples of that. Megan, what do you, what else would you recommend on Thanksgiving day? So I kind of have two, two lanes that I like. Mm-hmm. One is a punch, which of course there's a big category, a uh, big chapter on, yep. because like, if you're hosting Thanksgiving, you're already doing a lot. Punch will make a little more effort in the beginning, but then it's a little more communal, right? People kind of serve themselves, they go back. Do it definitely a little lighter in alcohol than you might think of a regular cocktail because it's a long day. You don't want anybody staying over that you didn't plan on. Like keep it light, keep it bright. Um, You can never go wrong with like some spiked apple cider situation and it's already, it's pretty hard to mess up. Um, (laughs) The other thing sometimes, especially if you're hosting at home, is sometimes it's time to wrap it up, right? So like serving a nightcap or like some kind of coffee cocktail can also be a like, and this is it friends. So sometimes cocktails are a good, like, this is, you know, either I'm greeting you, but sometimes I'm like, and it's just about time to go friends. So yeah, keep that in your back pocket for, uh, for your family sometimes. <laughs> All right. Well, um, with that, I know there were so many good questions in here. If any of you guys want to ask me and Megan, uh, you know, questions separately, we are both on Instagram and on Twitter. I am at A.L. Stillman and Megan is at Ginger Ricky. And I'm, I would love to talk to all of you about cocktails, um, you know, for like more, many more hours. Um, but, but, you know, duty calls. Um, so thank you everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. This was just really such a pleasure. And Megan, thanks so much for joining us and sharing your, your expertise. And Angela, um, do you want to come back and send us off officially? I can, I guess, technically. (laughs) And, uh, this was so much needed, I think, and so well appreciated by everyone here. Yes. And again, I, I want to say on behalf of our audience, thank you for offering to answer outstanding questions 
on your social media account. Again, we wrote that in the chat, but you can't see it obviously if you're not here. So um, if you actually attended live, the handles are A.L. Stillman and Ginger Ricky. So you can find both Adrian and Megan there. And again, the book is Spirited Cocktails from Around the World by Adrian Stillman. I, I mean, what I cannot ask people who do virtual events to both bring books. This is incredible. So thank <laughs> you so much. And I'm again, my library. Yeah. <laughs> It's multifunctional, uh, especially this year in 2020. Um, so again, bookshop.org, you can buy Spirited, and please feel free to stop by Megan's wonderful bars, Rain's Law Room, and Dear Irving. Again, you can, of course, grab some of the drinks that were made here tonight as well. Yeah. I'm going to be re-watching this over and over. I'm sure many people, I'm looking at the chat right now, will be as well. Again, please send them your outstanding questions. We'll be happy to have them. Please, if you're in NYC, support Megan's bars and of course your local bars during this very, very strange time for your local businesses. And uh, and again, it's gifting time regardless. Uh, support your local bookstores as well um, through buying books early too. So just if you're going to be gifting cocktails, of course be gifting spirited as well with it. Um, and any closing thoughts, Adrian and Megan, before we go? And then I guess we'll sign off. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to say if you're not going out or buying drinks right now, just say hi to your favorite bartender, you know, on Instagram or something because uh, they miss you, I assure you. Yeah, that's true. And there are a lot of online, uh, there's some funds that you can tip your favorite bartenders as well, which is a really nice way to, to help them out during this tough time. Uh, and that's perfectly said, I think, too. So again, thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. Please, again, re reach out to our wonderful panelists and with your outstanding questions as well. And again, please take care of yourself right now, especially right now. Take care of each other. Take care of your local businesses. Thank you again to Adrian and Megan. And thank you, everyone. We hope to see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Angela. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.